inside the house just wasn't wasn't appropriate to do that sort of thing in the house. And so they went ahead with the bathroom in the house, but they kept the outhouse until Grandpa died. So he could stay with what he believed was appropriate behavior inside and out. Well, that's becoming maybe just a tad more rigid than, uh, than what is maybe even healthy in some cases. Now, some of you have heard me talk about my own grandfather who died in 87 back in Oklahoma several years ago. Um, he won up to this guy. He didn't have an outhouse. Didn't have any indoor plumbing. And when I say, Grandpa, where do we, you know, carry on with business? He said, there's 80 acres here. Okay? So, <laughs> we were up to picking our spot. That's why we always spent the nights at my uncle's house. <laughs> it's one thing to find your spot in the daylight. It's quite a different thing, you know, to say, the night call is here. Now what? I probably couldn't find one of those corn cobs <laughs> at the back of the barn anyway. And it dawned on me years later. That's what hmm, uh, the corn cobs were all about. <laughs> and I wondered what a strange collection. <laughs> but, uh, my grandfather was inflexible in some ways. His sons, and he had many of them. About 11, tried to get him to let them put a pump on his well. And he said, I've never had any trouble with that water. We're not going to mess with it. So as a little kid, I got great joy going out there. That was my responsibility, to draw the water from the well. Uh, well, there was a certain inflexibility in my grandfather. And I think all of us, as we go along, and you younger people, you think, well, I'm not going to be inflexible. Yeah, you are. You just don't know yet what you're going to be inflexible about. You will probably get into a rut or a pattern uh, and not completely realize it until you say, well, I'm not going in that direction. But think about some of the biblical characters who go way beyond inflexibility. Abraham, he's 75 years old, and God says to him, I want you to move. Okay, uh, if this is you asking me to move, I will. Uh, where? Well, I'll show you. Pack up and start out. Now, do you have that kind of flexibility? When someone says at age 75, uh, forget your plans down at the funeral home, uh, start looking for a school, you're going to be a dad. Well, that's not my idea of retirement. It'll happen. And 25 years later, when he's 100 years old, that boy, that promised boy is, is born. I'm glad he was flexible. What about the early Christians? The Jerusalem church at first was combined, comprised mainly of Jewish Christians. And they had to adjust to thinking about those outsiders, those Gentiles, that we never really liked them. They don't like us. And now God wants us to come together as one people. Mm. Adjust. Show some flex, flexibility. Uh, look at this passage from Ecclesiastes. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. Now some of you have been asking that question lately. Well, this is not like the good old days. Um, I think every generation asks that question. Solomon was asking that question before Christ ever came. Why were the good old days the good old days and today's everything's falling apart? He said, that's not a smart question. Um, God is sovereign over all circumstances. Jesus said in the Gospel of Luke, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But 
new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Here he's talking about flexibility. Why don't you put the new wine into old wineskins? Because the old wineskins are rigid. They're not flexible. And when you put new wine in there, the fermentation will expand those inflexible wineskins and burst them, and you're going to lose your container, and you're going to lose the new wine that's put in there. And then here's the kicker. No one after drinking old wine wishes for new. Why would I want new wine? I'm content with vintage stuff. This is the best stuff. They don't make it now like they made it then. And the aging process has only helped it here. He says the old is good enough. Isn't that right? Come on, you seniors. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. The old is good enough. All right. But he says that's the way we become. We become inflexible that way. Where we think, what's wrong with when we've always done it? Let's keep doing it that way. Number three, feelings of regret. This is sometimes a temptation to see your face to live in the past and regret what you didn't do right. I don't know what you didn't do right in the past, but I know there's something you didn't do right. And you may want to mug it. You may want to do it over again. But sometimes life doesn't give you a, a do-over. Okay? David said, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. He wrote this shortly after his sin with Bathsheba and putting to death her husband Uriah. And he says, I can't get that out of my mind. I regret that. I, what was I thinking? What was I doing? How could my heart get into such a shape that I was doing that? And now I'm living with that. I can't, I can't get it out of my mind. It's ever before me living in that kind of regret. Think about Joseph's ten brothers who sold him into slavery and said out of the oaths as he went off to Egypt. And then years later, they have a reunion. And this time they bring the young brother Benjamin as well. And when they find out that the second in command in Egypt is their long lost and unloved brother, Joseph, do you think there was some regret there? Do you think there was some fear there? That their past would somehow another cost them now? That payday was now due? Well, he's not going to harm us now, but you know, I bet when you know dad came and when dad dies, then watch, he's not going to break his dad's heart. But something bad is going to happen when, when dad dies, and then Joseph calls him in. And Joseph, to his credit, was not one who lived in the past. He started a new day, and he wanted them to start a new day. And to get out of this fear of the past catching up and punishing them. While the way we get out of this self-pity and these feelings of unworthiness, when it causes us to miss the joy of forgiveness, is to take the cure and accept forgiveness. Look at what Isaiah said. Come now, let us settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, let's settle this. You're living in the past. You have these regrets. Uh, you'd raise your kids differently. You'd do different uh, things that work than what you did in your... Well, okay, everyone has those regrets and the past that they don't care for. Get over yourself. Get over your mistakes. Accept forgiveness for it. That's the joy of, of being a Christian. And that's why I can stand before you and I can say, and you can say too, that I am righteous. On your track record? No. On his track record. Because he's done the, 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 all that was right. He's done the good thing. He was righteous and his righteousness has been transferred to me. In Christ, I'm a new creation. He became sin so that I might become the righteousness of God. That's who I am. That's my new identity. Believe it. Trust it. And start off new. Start off fresh. Isn't it interesting how we like to change the past? And what we need to do is just let go of it. Ever, you know, it's been a while since I've been bowling. 
but you can hardly go bowling where you don't see somebody trying to coax the bowling ball to go in the right direction after they let it go. Now we do the same thing for our kids, you know, sometimes we, we raise the kids here and then we let them go and then we're like bowlers and our, we tilt our heads and we try to encourage the ball to go in this direction or we sway over this way, we may even kick. Some people even go down the, the alleyway just a little bit. Let it go. One of the best strikes I ever got was a, a 710 pickup. Now those of you who know something about both know that the 7 and the 10 pin are the hardest ones to pick up. You may as well just pick one up and go for one and settle uh, for something less than a strike. But I got a strike with a 710 uh, not a strike, but a, what do you call that? A, a spare. I got a spare. I got both of those. But the ball went into the gutter and bounced out and got them both. Yes! <laughs> and some of them had the ugliness to say, that doesn't count. If it goes in the gutter, it's a gutter ball. You still have, I think he was just pulling my leg out. He was. Best shot I ever made. And of course, I'm trying to think, what? You're saying that doesn't count, and that was my strategy? Come on. Get it over there, in the gutter, just right at the right time, let it bounce back, and you're you got to just okay. Well, sometimes we're that way with the past, and the regret that we have in the past, and, you know, we're afraid this one is going into the gutter. And we try to influence them and keep them out of the gutter. If you let them go, pray. It's the best thing you can do. And let God be your partner in that. A critical spirit. Now, who would have thought of that? that seniors struggle with this as a temptation to be critical. You notice again at the bottom of your outline there, <coughs> Titus chapter 2. He says, Titus encouraged the older women likewise to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious, not malicious, gossips, nor enslaved to much wine. Gossiping or being critical. We can even do it with a prayer request. You know, we want to remember uh, Sister So-and-So in our prayers because she has this real big struggle with, and then we go into details. But I'm being pious. I want to bring this to your attention. And we need to pray for her because it's ugly. Well, it's ugly gossip sometimes. That's what it is. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul said, do everything without complaining and arguing. Get out of this critical spirit. And I'm hesitant to say this, but you may have thought, you may have said, it's too hot in here, or it's too cold. Based on what standard? Well, my thermometer I have the thermostat in this congregation. And so I say it's too hot or it's too cold. Or we sing the wrong songs, right? Do you, do you not know that, that music in every denomination, I don't care what church you go to, there's what they call the worship wars. Are we going to sing the contemporary 7-Eleven songs, seven words repeated 11 times? Are we going to sing the Christian classics? Well, some of those Christian classics that Isaac Watts wrote, you realize they were stoutly resisted when he brought them in. And people were saying to Isaac Watts, that great hymn writer that we adore, who wrote the classic hymns, they were saying to him, 
What is wrong with the songs that we've always been singing? They're directly out of the Bible. They're scriptural. And you're thinking that what you can say in your poetry is better than or more important than the Bible? Come on, Isaac. You're on a little wattage here, brother. He wrote them, and we were blessed by them. Despite the critical spirit, despite the inflexibility of some of those who resisted him at that time. Someone says, well, I don't know. I couldn't pay attention to your sermon, Ron, because of that kid. Why don't somebody do something for that kid? I'm glad to hear the sound of the little ones. We're thinking about the future. Yes, maybe kids need attention. But why focus necessarily only <coughs> on the negative? What would you say is the number one temptation that teen, uh, seniors face based on this survey that Bob Russell did? Well, your guess? Worry. Anxiety. And what do you think is the number one anxiety that seniors typically have? It's about their kids. They worry about their kids. They worry about their grandkids. I said something to my grandmother once, and she repeated it to me. She knew that she worried and was anxious at times. And I said, Big Mama, why would you worry about something you can change? If you can change it, change it. And if you can't change something, why are you worrying about it? Well, that pretty well covers a lot of territory, doesn't it? Don't worry about what you can change, change it. If you can't change it, it's useless to worry about it. And she would catch herself if she would repeat that to me. But it's just part of who we become over time. We worry about those who follow us, our children, our grandchildren, and so forth. And it's biblical. Can you think of a mother who was worried about her kids? Here's that story in Matthew. The mother of James and John. Now they were doing pretty good. They had this thriving fishing business and Jesus said, drop your nets and follow me. And then they became part of the inner circle. Peter, James, and John were part of the inner circle of Jesus as close to him as anybody. But now here's mom. The mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, she came to Jesus with her sons and she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request, Jesus asked. She replied, in your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. I want my kids to succeed now. Is that, am I out of place to ask this with my boys? Come on. I'd like my boys to be on your left hand and on your right hand because you know I just want to see them do well. I want to see them succeed. Someone said, you know, I'm not, Get used to it, kids. As long as your mother lives, she's always looking for improvement. As long as you live, she's always looking for improvement. <laughs> and wait, you know, don't be looking at your kids now. <laughs> Excuse me for a second. <laughs> I saw someone I contact. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name names. But, uh, you always look for improvement, and you always have your hopes up. But don't be anxious. Jesus said, "Don't be anxious for tomorrow. Be anxious for today." He says, "You've got enough to worry about today. Don't borrow trouble from tomorrow." Uh, entrust yourself to God, and that will get rid of all the worries. Let's conclude with a passage here on the back of your bulletin from Isaiah chapter 46, verses 3 and 4. God says, You have been born by me from before your birth. You've been born or carried by me. Isn't that interesting? As abortion and this late edition in the news here uh, in New York and in Virginia about when can you abort a child? God says, before you were born, I was carrying you. You were a person in the womb. Carried from the womb. 
even to your old age, I am he. And to gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made and I will bear, I will carry and will save. What a great promise. Harper concludes, don't be afraid, Christian. You will persevere.